Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. I've been doing this podcast since September of 2012, and boy, are my lips tired. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. And I'm also happy because I have a guest joining me today who is a master, certified master life coach. We're not just talking any life coach here. We're nope. talking certified master. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds cool. I'll, I'll, I'll just <laughs> put it that. <laughs> we'll let Michael tell us about it. But his name is Michael Nemina. And uh, like I said, he is a certified master life coach. He's got some interesting uh, things that he does too. And we're, we're going to get to a few of them later on, including something called a reinvention retreat. Ooh, sounds good. But first of all, Michael, welcome to the program. How are you doing today? I am doing great. Thank you so much for having me here. I am very excited to have a conversation with you. So, cool. Yeah, we're right. we excited too. This is going to be good. And out by the way, one of my co-hosts who does the Friday show with me, his name is Neil Positivity. He makes t-shirts and wears them around and they all say in big letters, thoughts become things. <laughs> there you have that written on the wall behind you. So yeah, I think we have the right guy in the right place. This is a good thing. Great. So, Give us your, your bio. How did you end up being the guy who's the certified master life coach? Well, you know, it's a very interesting story. Um, it could take more than an hour, but we won't do that. I'll give you the condensed version. Oh, that so helps. For, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for me, um, I, you know, I, I went the pretty, st- I grew up in New York and I, I went the standard route of career and was very successful in business. Um, for many, many years, over 30 years, I was a creative director for very well-known uh, companies that you would, you know, household names, so to speak, and had a great career um, and was very happy with my life. Um, externally, everything looked perfect, but internally, mm-hmm. things were not okay. Yeah. So I know that that's a pretty common story for most people, but I decided that um, I could no longer not live in the integrity and the truth of what I needed to do for myself to, to live my life more authentically, to make sure that my inside matched or my outside, I should say, matched my inside. So what, um, you know, after a 30 year career, um, very successful, I, um, was very fortunate to attend a workshop that was given by the late Debbie Ford called the shadow process. Uh Ah, And the shadow process was a weekend deep dive into your stuff, (laughs) as she called it, where you couldn't really hide from the truth of who, of what was sort of bothering you and holding you back in your life. Isn't that annoying? I mean, you can't even hide from it anymore. Could not. Could not. I mean, people were like punching the wall. It was crazy. (laughs) It was crazy. But for me, it was absolutely the pinnacle moment where I could not hold back any longer from Mm. really facing my truth. So, and it wasn't even so much that, you know, the truth wasn't for me like, oh, I'm a gay man. I need to come out of the closet. It wasn't even that. That had already happened. The truth Mm. for me was that I really didn't love myself. Mm. And I really didn't even understand what that meant or understand that I needed to change that. But that weekend shifted it for me. And then I was so fortunate that, a coach, one of her coaches came up to me and said, Hey, I would love to take you through the program and coach you through this breakthrough shadow. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, sure. Like, you know, you're going to give me free coaching. I was all about that. (laughs) I knew the value of what he was offering me. And I was so fortunate to work with him and learn so much about going inside and, um, you know, as Neil Donald Walsh also says, the author, if you don't go inside, you go without. And when I went inside, that's when I really discovered what I needed to excavate and, and, mm. and really work on. So from there, he offered me a couple of other programs and I went to wow. another shadow process for another butt kicking weekend. And from there, I said, you know what? I, this work, they should give away at the grocery store. That <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, so I want to, I want to shift my life and, and be in service. So, you know, how did you become a master certified life coach? You know, I went to school for two years um, Mm. and studied. And part of that was not only learning coaching skills and how to become a coach, but it was how to clean up more of my own stuff. And, you know, I believe that if you don't come as clean as you can as a coach, 
then your clients are never going to be able to really navigate because you're going to be, you're going to be working through your own stuff. So, you know, it took time. Um, and I got my first certification, then I got another certification and then I found another, um, academy called 11 Life Coach Academy. And from there I went on and got, um, five more certifications. And you might be thinking, well, why do you need all these certifications? They're all specified in a particular area, like boundaries or worthy or new relationships uh, or, okay. and your life will appear. So I have the, uh, the tools now to take clients and I do through whatever they're, they're sort of faced with in their life. And that's mm-hmm. what got me to this point right now where I decided to leave the big corporate gig and uh, really head out on my own and be of service to people. And that's where I am today, two years later, um, out there you know, doing my thing and uh, creating lots of great opportunities for people to reinvent themselves and to go inside and take that journey with me supporting them and holding the space for them to really find what they need to create the life that they truly desire. Just as those people who you met at that first uh, shadow conference held some space for you. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, and a few interesting things kind of pop out at me, uh, in your story. First, when you went to that first, uh, that first gathering, that first shadow conference, um, I mean, it's pretty clear that's when your tipping point happened. But what was that tipping point? Like what, like, I mean, obviously you were dealing with stuff, the stuff, you know, all that stuff we don't want to deal with, but, but you were dealing with it to some degree and with some level of success. And these people came in and said, look, we can take you to the next level. But somewhere in there, there was like what they often call an aha moment, right? Yeah. Where, where all of a sudden the lights come on and you say, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. That, whoa, that, that was bigger than I thought it was going to be. Do you remember what that was? I remember what the, the thing was that really was the 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 thing that i realized was holding me back and that okay. was shame oh. shame was holding me back and from that shame i was unable to really love myself and to understand what that meant as i mentioned before but also the shame held me back from really living the life that i know i truly deserve uh, because when when I was, and I speak for myself, when I was sort of swimming in all that shame, I didn't even realize that there was any other way of being. You know, it becomes an unconscious uh, driver of your life, shame, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, or trauma or those or these belief, beliefs about yourself. They mm-hmm. become these these like uh, operating systems and drivers for your life that you don't sure. even realize are there. So for me, the shame was so deep that I, I, I'm not going to lie. I spent a lot of that first weekend just sobbing for the shame that I had felt within myself. Part of it was being a gay man and not living up to, you know, my family expectations or Mm -hmm. whatever it was. But part of it was also hiding myself, hiding the truth of who I was. Again, not so much of hiding myself as a gay person, but it was more about just hiding who I was because I was so scared of people seeing who I truly was. Like, you know, like I was kind and I was generous and, you know, but underneath it, there was all of the shame that was holding me down. So I would say, you know, for me, the biggest aha was like, wow, there's so much shame here that, you know, needs to be worked through. And as Debbie Ford used to say, so often she was a master with these kind of things. You know, you could put as much whipped cream or ice cream on top of poop, but until you <laughs> still get poop, in yeah. there, it's still <laughs> underneath. So you got to, you know, once that whipped cream is gone. Um, so it was time to dig deep and to clean it all out, but it was shame. That, that makes a lot of sense to me on a number of levels, not the least of which is I really don't like to put ice cream or whipped cream on, on poop at all under any circumstances. So, yeah. <laughs> I don't think anybody really does when it comes down to it. Um, but, yeah, it makes total sense to me. Uh, a couple of the things that came to my mind there as you were uh, uh, telling your story, the uh, the whole idea of, of self-love, uh, you, you said basically you had realized you'd been hiding who your true self was. So I'm going to kind of, you know, put you on the spot, so to speak, and ask you, so who is your true self? Have you figured that out? Can you define that for us? 
Yeah. I mean, my true self truly is someone who feels confident in my own shoes, so to speak, you know, who is truly living life authentically as me. And those might sound a little bit like cliched words, but they're really not when you truly step into that truth and you know that, you know, you can trust who you are. And what I've also learned for me is that it's very important for me, not from a codependent people pleasing perspective, mm -hmm. but truly from a place of, of groundedness to be of service to people. Mm. You know, I, I, you know, people say, well, what's your purpose? Or, you know, why are you here? Like, I honestly believe that, you know, part of it used to be people pleasing for sure. Like, please accept me, please accept me. Now it's really, how can I be of service to you? How can I support you in, in what you need in your life? Which yeah. actually sounds like a fairly simple transition to me. Yeah, but it took, it took time to get there. Mm. Actually, You know, it's, mm. it's. It's a little bit of semantics of words, you yeah. know, it, you know, first I was wanting to get something when you're a people pleaser, you need mm -hmm. to get something, mm -hmm. you know, you need to get validated. You need to mm -hmm. feel worthy. You need to mm -hmm. get X, Y, or Z mm -hmm. when you are giving, when you are being of service, you are truly in a place of giving. Yeah. That is the distinction. Yeah. And that's a big shift. Mm -hmm. Yep. They both involved helping other people, but just in with different uh, motivations, really. Okay. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. One, I believe, is much more healthy than the other. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you on that. I think it's pretty much true of everybody who appears on the show. In fact, I say so usually at the end of, of each episode, how everybody who comes onto the show is a giver. And it's true. They are. You are. We all are. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you're familiar with the Enneagram, but I am a two. I am a helper. So that I'm not familiar. Uh, enlighten me. Okay. Tell me. Yeah. So the Enneagram is a wonderful, um, I am not going to do it justice, but it's, it's <laughs> ancient, actually, oh, system okay. of looking at um, personality traits and behaviors and understanding what you possess and what are sort of your highest um, traits and characteristics and using those as a, a sort of a comprehension for why you do what you do. Okay. And um, so you can go online to the Enneagram Institute. You could take an, uh, you know, a free exam and find out um, what your number is, so to speak. It's one through nine. And, and within each one of them, there are characteristics. And once you sort of start seeing it and, and you see who you are, like for me, I'm the helper, um, you also then could start looking at other people and perhaps saying, oh, I wonder if they're a nine, which is a rescuer or, you know, there's there's all these different um, ways of people being and and the way their traits show up in the world. Um, and there's a lot of philosophy within the Enneagram community that if everybody understood what their numbers were and what their strengths were and how to sort of uh, be conscious of the way they walk through life, life, people would be, people would be much more, um, well, people would be much more harmonious. Let's put it that way, because you can, you can acknowledge, oh yeah, there's the nine just being the, the need to rescue people, or there's the, the helper just needing to come in and help. You know, it sort of gives a, um, gives a little bit of a label, but not a label in a bad way, but it gives a versus just being ethereal. Like, well, why does this person do that? You know, first versus going, Oh yeah, the seven needs to work this way. Or the one is the one who comes in and wants to make sure everything's in order or those kinds of things. Um, so I'm going a little bit down a road on that, but the Enneagram is really cool and check it out. Um, but knowing that I'm a helper makes perfect sense. Um, but also then helps me understand why I also struggled for a lot of years in business because I wasn't the one that was the best negotiator because I was the one that wanted to help, yeah. you know, so mm -hmm. it starts to help you understand your, your characteristics and your behaviors. It, it sounds also like the Enneagram is a way of learning how to accept and appreciate others for where they are re without trying to change them in some way. A hundred percent. That's absolutely correct. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, um, th there's so much writing on, on the Enneagram. And again, the idea that if we were all conscious of the, the gifts that we all bring, we can support each other through some of the things that feel really challenging. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have to admit, I, I've always just preferred to just accept for what they are and find out what that is. But if the Enneagram works for you to do that, then hey, go for it. I love it. Go for yeah. it every single time. Yeah. <laughs> It's just another tool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's always good to have tools. We don't have to use them all. Correct. That's one thing that people often feel like, oh, I have to use all the tools. You don't have to use all the tools, but it's good to know what they are. Exactly. Yeah. And to keep sort of collecting them. I mean, you don't want to have your own, you know, Home Depot, but, (laughs) but having a bunch of tools is pretty good, is a good thing. Yeah. I mean, you you may not be using a pair of pliers every day, but if you know what they are and how to use them, that's good because someday you may actually need a pair of pliers. Absolutely. And being able to stop and notice and Mm -hmm. say, Hey, what was that thing that I learned? Oh yeah, that's, that's Mm going to be helpful here. You know, mm-hmm. underst- taking a pause, you know, is one of the big tools that I often suggest to clients, you know, like before you respond, like take a pause because then you're going to be coming not from a reactive place, but a place of truth. Mm-hmm. That's not, that's a good policy, a good strategy. I like that. So I know you were mentioning earlier and, and we also discussed before we got started today that self-love is a big deal for you. So yes. let's talk about that for a bit. First of all, what does that mean to you? I mean, let's just kind of like lay a foundation down. When you talk about self-love, what are you talking about? I am talking about fully accepting myself for the truth of who I am exactly as I am. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I'm also talking about um, trusting who I am, feeling comfortable who I am, with whom, whom I am, and also putting myself first in my life, which does not mean ignoring the needs or, you know, not wanting to participate in life with others, but it's putting myself in a position where I am in my healthiest place. Almost giving yourself permission to be number one. Exactly. Right. Because I truly believe that when we can come from that place of self love then we we have it to give. Mm-hmm. Then we have the love to give. If we don't, then what do we what do we have to give? Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't. I can't give it to you because I don't have it. Yeah. So how can I give it to you? Uh, we kind of skip that very often. Not just with this, but with a lot of things. We're, I'm going to give something that I don't have. Well, good luck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And and so and again, that sounds like a very simple thing, but when you know, at the end of the day, it's really not. And, mm. um, you know, it's, it, you can think about that with a lot of things, yeah. but you know, I believe love is really the essence. It's the place that is the truth of who we are in this core. And until we can really feel grounded within it, it you know, I, I, I can't give you what I don't have. So when I can get in there and really clean out as much of that poop as we can, um, then I can I can come from a much more authentic, healthy place. You know, not every day is perfect, Walt. I'll tell you that right now. But really? Oh no! Oh, Wait, but you just let, you, you just ruined the ending. Come on. <laughs> yeah, that was the no, I'm ending. Um, yeah, no, I know that. Not every day is perfect, but that's the difference too. When you can be in a place of self love, you can catch yourself a lot quicker mm, and just go, that's true. "Oh yeah, there I am doing that behavior again." Like, let me pull this back. Let me recenter. You know, what do I need to do to get myself not only, you know, to not go down the rabbit hole, but to see the hole and go, nope, I'm not going down that hole Mm. where I used to be able to spend a lot of time down in that rabbit hole, beating myself up and making myself wrong and shaming myself and, you know, those things that are very common, Mm -hmm. um, you know, so for me, part of the self-love and the self, you know, the self-confidence and the self-trust, I think they, the three go hand in hand. Yes. Give you that opportunity to say, oop, there's the hole. I'm not going in. Mm. Like, oh, this happened. I'm going to think about it or react to it differently than perhaps I would have before so that I don't wind up going down that hole again. Very good. Yeah. And for, for me, um, self-love is, is one half of a complementary pair. The other half being social connection or human connection. To me, sure. the, the, the two are the one, are, they, they go together. If you don't really have both of them going on, you really haven't done the whole job yet. Correct. And I would also say partnered with self-love is self-care. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, clearly if you're self, if you're, if you're claiming self-love and you're not giving yourself care, 
then how much self-love are you giving to yourself? Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, becomes, it becomes lip service. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. <laughs> pretty quickly. And because it plays out pretty quickly too. That's the really scary part. Yeah. yeah. But so much of that thing gets tied into worthiness for people. Oh God. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I'm not worthy of that. Like, why would I, you know, like, don't be mm-hmm. too big for your britches. Who do you think you are? Like those kinds of messages that we received, you know, why would I give myself self care? You know, why would I love myself? That's not, you know, that's not good. Um, and of course, the truth is, we're all still continuing to to, re- to discover these things about ourselves. I mean, you know, as much work as we might, we might do and and learn to love ourselves and all that kind of thing. Every single day, we, we we find something new. Oh, I didn't realize I was doing that. Oh, I didn't realize I had that kind of tendency going on. Oh, I didn't realize I was playing that tape. It's amazing how often they just keep popping up and popping up. And that's like part of the life experience, really. Absolutely, and I believe. Um... It'll always continue. And mm-hmm. I'm grateful that it will because then it continues to give me lessons. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people say, Oh, I'm peeling back the layer of the onion, you know, and my thing is I have sort of changed that metaphor a little bit and I'm sort of doing the, you know, peeling back the petals of the rose. Oh, okay. So yeah, just to sort of make it a little sweeter, you know, a little okay. prettier maybe. And, um, because I don't think that those lessons stink necessarily, you know, when you think of the mm-hmm. onion. I think each of those lessons are so important that, you know, every time we have that new opportunity to, to look at something differently or to look at the way we approach or we challenge or are challenged, um, it's truly an opportunity for growth. And I know for me, I want to keep on growing um, so that I can continue to have more fulfillment and opportunity to see the world differently. Speaking of seeing the world differently, you're reminding me uh, when, when you referred to the stink of the onion, I, I thought to myself, well, look, that's not the way I think about it. I, I love the taste of onion. I love the onion, taste. Onion is delicious. The <laughs> and then I realized, oh, you're talking about smell. I'm talking about taste. No wonder. Okay. Yeah. If I get frying them up like, and putting it on a burger, that's yummy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I like that. Well, actually, I like it in, in most of the food that I eat. They're, I mean, it's a great flavor. It's a wonderful yes. flavor to include with other flavors. So, yeah. But it, once again, showing demonstrating how important not only the context is, but also perspective. How yes. are you thinking about it? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's one of the biggest things that I've learned doing this show, how much I have come to appreciate the value of perspective. Mm-hmm. Cause you interview enough people like yourself, eventually you're going to get so many different perspectives. And I've interviewed hundreds of people. Um, you're going to get to the point where all those perspectives are affecting you in ways you don't even know about. And and one of the things I like to point out a lot is the perspectives, this kind of pisses me off too, but one of the perspectives I've learned from the most are from the people I disagree with the most. Is that because it forces you to sort of see it in another way to sort of 180 on it or what's the... not Well, kind of. It, not so much that it forces me to, it challenges me to. Okay. Like, okay, are, are you going to, are you willing to look at this thing this person is saying that you really don't like on the surface? Because the first tendency is to say, oh, I'm just ruling it out. But when you do interviews like this, well, if you just rule it out, you can turn it into a nice controversial show, and that always you know, gets interest. But from my perspective of what I'm trying to get out of doing the show for myself, because that's, you know, I mean, talk about doing things for number one. I do this show primarily for me, and I, I just happen to have these listeners, and I love the fact that the listeners are along for the ride. But really, number one, it's for me. What right. am I going to get out of it? And I'm not going to get a whole lot of it out of it if I am just dismissing it because dismiss because I don't like it on the surface. So I, from my perspective, I need to go deeper it, and it's a choice that I'm making. Yes. And interestingly enough, when I go, when I choose to make that choice, that's like I say, that's when I find I learn the most, which pisses yes. me off to no end, but nevertheless. <laughs> well, I, just, I, I don't know if you saw something that's going all over social media this week. And um, I was actually at a conference this past weekend and one of the speakers brought it up. They said like, um, there's, uh, what is it? B, C, and D. So B is birth and D is death and C is choice, which is everything in between. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So it's all about choice and, yeah. and the choices that you make and, you know, how, um, you know, one of my mentors actually says, you know, your life is like a crystal ball. I wrote it about it, this in my weekly email this week. You know, you can predict your future based on the choices that you're making today. Oh, yeah. 
So if you're, you know, you can look at that crystal ball and go, okay, so my life's going to look exactly like this unless I make a different choice. Yeah. Well, I mean, going back to the original theme of the show, that's what law of attraction is all about. You, what, what you're focusing on now, you're going to get more of later on. Right. So be careful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because yeah. yeah. like you were saying earlier, we're, we're good at doing all kinds of things like beating ourselves up and, and, you know, looking at negatively at situations and so forth. And by gosh, every single time we do that, very soon down the road, we get more opportunities for it. It's just amazing how fast. Yeah, and I also happens. believe, you know, again, with the whole conscious consciousness of the law of attraction, which is, you know, the thoughts become things, Mike Dooley, that whole thing. I'm one of his certified trainers also. Oh, are you really? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, love I am. Yeah. I'm an infinite possibilities trainer through yeah. him as well. Okay. Um, you know, we, we, I believe we are like magnets. So we, we magnetize to us, not right. only the lessons, you know, the, not only the positive or some of the, also some of the challenges, um, so that we have the opportunity to work through things. Well, that's the hardest part, I think, of law of attraction theory is accepting that I attracted that stuff I didn't want. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it's that whole thing. I was just having this conversation. I did a group, uh, last night. And we were talking about, is this happening to me or is this happening for me? <laughs> and could we accept that this is happening for me, um, even when it looks like a, a very difficult situation? Um, you know, and there are many examples of people who, you know, never sort of can see it from that perspective. But those that can, can also find an inner peace if you can say, yeah, this is really happening for me. This is changing my life. Mm -hmm. This is allowing me to find another tool that can um, offer me a, a different perspective or a new way of seeing. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, I, I think for me, the biggest thing that made the biggest impact for me when I was still learning this stuff, it was, it's actually the reason why I started the podcast. I wanted to understand it. I, I, I was far from being an expert on LOA when I started LOA today. Um, and I was in a really bad place and that's why I need to know. Um, but as I have learned it over time, as I've applied it over time, I've come to realize the best thing that I can do is to appreciate the fact that what I don't like comes to me when I focus on what I don't like and that mm -hmm. I'm the one who's doing that. Right. Because that, that requires a degree of ownership that is, that most people aren't willing to face up to, to be perfectly honest. I've had people accuse me of being an extremist for, for viewing that, expressing that viewpoint. Um, but I found that not only is it true, it's empowering. Mm. It's incredibly empowering because yeah, I'm attracting this crap that I don't really want. But if you notice, if I notice that I'm doing that often enough, if I'm, if I become aware of that often enough, that, that actually did more for me to, reinforce that the law of attraction is real than all the positive stuff coming into my life. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, all the stuff that's coming to you again is for you, even the more challenging stuff yeah. or each time that you sort of try something and, and it doesn't work, you know, um, it, it's there for, to give you mm. a lesson. You know, it's, it's, it's that whole thing of, you didn't really make a mistake. You made a mistake. So yeah, you right. have the opportunity to sort of, you know, try it again. And if it doesn't work that time, you know, it, it's okay. Let's take it again. Um, and all of those things that we attract to ourselves, I truly believe are for the evolution of our soul and to bring us to a higher level of consciousness and mm -hmm. awareness. There's also a, a racial, and by racial, I mean human race. There's a, there is a racial piece of this in that, um, as information, now th this may or may not go with some idea, people's idea of law of attraction theory. We'll just put law of attraction theory aside for the moment just to, to touch on this. But there, there is a belief system that I buy into that says that there is an accumulation of knowledge on a racial basis. In other words, the human race accumulating knowledge that the rest of the human race can tap into. And indeed, scientists have been able to, to identify the same kind of phenomena with, with other species as well. Um, what I'm curious to know from your perspective is you were describing, I think quite accurately, that uh, we're here for personal expansion and, and for you know, how that affects the, the real us, the inner us, the inner being us. But I'm also wondering to what degree do you think what you're doing is contributing to the, the human race knowledge? Let me see if I fully grasp all that. Um, I, well, I honestly believe also that if I change the way I am, 
I'm creating space for you to change the way you are. Okay. So if I can see things differently and I can act a certain way, then I'm giving permission to other people to, to consider it for, to try it on for themselves. Okay. So the more I can be in a place for myself of groundedness, consciousness, um, you know, of service, you become a, an example of that. And mm -hmm. those that are also on a precipice or looking for consciousness shift will come along for the ride. And yeah, that right. then, you know, becomes that ripple effect. Right. Sure. And then before you know it, you know, you're, um, you're, you're sort of, you're sort of changing the, the consciousness. There's, yeah. there's also another piece of that too, that, I've been coming more and more attuned to, and that is, I mean, we, we certainly understand vibrationally, if you're putting out a certain vibration and other people are relatively in the same range, they're going to be able to pick it up too. But it also happens to be true that if you're putting out something that is a higher vibrational frequency than other people are ready for, it still positively affects them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we just don't see the results right away. So we think that it's not affecting them. Right. And then at some point it kicks in and no one's able to identify where it came from. They themselves aren't able to identify perhaps that it even happened, but there it is. It's happening. Yes. yes. So, so the net result is anytime that we're learning something that basically helps us get into a higher vibrational state, we're adding to the higher vibrational nature of the human race. Correct. Like if you've ever been to, you know, a yoga retreat or you've been to a place where there's, you know, 500 people meditating or that kind of thing when you're, you yeah, that's a quick way to get, it's like getting a, a surge of it at that point. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. It's like turbocharge. You know, yeah, you right. definitely feel that, um, yeah. energy and mm -hmm. in the space. And what's beautiful is like, you know, I've been in like drumming circles where suddenly like, horses have shown up like you know animals, <laughs> like, you know we're, we've done them outside on a farm and you know animals are coming to the energy yeah yeah and just wanting to be in that space um you know that i've, I've done a lot of work in peru um doing a lot of transformational work and taking people on sacred journeys and there you know when you're in that consciousness it becomes this this vibration that just mm. spreads out and before you know it you know you've got all these people sort of tagging along yeah. um which a lot of you know uh leaders um you know those that use it for good those that maybe don't use it for as good you know are able to sort of corral people into their energy that mm. way you know that's sort of a mental sort of perspective but also from a physical you know we have um, you know, around our bodies, we have this thing called, and I might, I might not call it the right thing, but it's like a Merkaba or a Merkaba, which is an energy field that mm -hmm. spreads out like 30 feet outside of us. Mm -hmm. So we can enter a room. Like if someone enters a room, you can almost feel their energy first before you Very often, them yeah. from them. Right. So when you get all these energies in a space that is sort of all melding together, you have the possibility of raising vibration mm. on a very, very high level. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting how that works too, uh, spatially. Um, yeah. Now this is also reminding me of something, especially based on what you just said, it's reminding me of something that you do. You you have these, we made reference to them earlier, these these reinvention retreats. And you were yeah. telling me about them before the show, but but tell the audience about that because that sounds like, that's kind of like a, a, a foundation ground or, or a building block ground for exactly the, the experience that we were just talking about. Exactly. Um, this is a great opportunity. We're doing one in Costa Rica um, at the end of July, last weekend in July, uh, first, oh. week in, uh, first week in August. And we are uh, going to this amazing retreat center that I believe is sacred ground in Costa Rica. And we are taking over the whole property, which is wow. amazing because you get to really deep dive. And on these retreats, um, there's a mixture of, of it's everything. It's, it's really looking at how do I return to the essence of who I am? It's actually called joyful haven. So it's, it's looking for your joy. Again, it's bringing it forward. It's celebrating who you are. And during the week, there's things like, um, there's definitely some deep dives into let's talk about beliefs or what's holding you back in life. Um, there's a lot of music. There's a woman who's coming and is co-facilitating with me who is 
a singer songwriter and she is bringing a lot of beautiful spiritual music. There's another woman that's coming who's a fellow coach and she's bringing um, all this mind, body, spirit work. Uh, we're mm -hmm. doing yoga. We're doing uh, breath work, singing bowls, fire work. Wow. Um, you know, those types of things. Um, and, you know, cooking classes where, you know, we're going snorkeling. So we're connecting with the yeah, there you go. a beach cleanup where you, it's brilliant. You work yeah. on one square foot of the beach and you find micro garbage basically oh, i see mm -hmm. and that alone helps to save multiple turtles in the ocean you know it's uh -huh. but it's all about intention and that's what these retreats are about this reinvention retreat is about returning to your essence with intention so when you leave you're leaving with a, a much better understanding of who you can be moving forward so it's an opportunity to unplug and an mm -hmm. opportunity to also reinvent, to reemerge and, mm -hmm. and look at life in a different way. And this is a week long event. It's a seven day event. And mm -hmm. next year I'm doing an LGBTQIA plus exclusive. So, oh. um, yeah, that's next March. Um, so I'm really excited. We have people signed up for that already where we're taking a deep dive into what it's like to be in a marginalized community and oh, what do we want to be? It's called pride, purpose, and possibility. So we're sort of floating through those three things and leaving again with purpose, but first starting with your intention and how you return to yourself. So those retreats are going to be really interesting and fun. And so it's all about you need to rest. You can rest. You need to eat. You can eat. You need to, you know, go for a swim. You can do that. Or, you can also take a deep dive and, um, you know, return to the essence of who you are. Uh, we're bringing in a woman who's doing a beautiful sacred ceremony to open up your heart, uh, mm -hmm. to reconnect to your heart space. We're doing arts and crafts. It's going to be really fun. And, and I know we have some listeners who that's going to be perking their ears up. They're going to say, oh, I learned more about that one. Um, so we'll provide links in the, uh, um, the, the show notes so that people can find a way. Um, you, you mentioned the idea that the place you're going to in Costa Rica is a sacred space. You think of it as a sacred space. What does that mean to you when you say it's a sacred space? You know, for me, it's vibrational. Okay. When, when I step onto a, a sacred ground or what I call like a holy ground, mm -hmm. um, then it, I, when I can feel my own connection to the earth, when I'm like, sort of like, take your shoes off, you know, yeah. like, you know, you're sort of hearing those messages where you, you know, that you, um, your senses are alive. You know, when, when you wake up there in this particular location, you're smelling the, the flowers, but you're hearing the howler monkeys and the iguanas running across the room of your, the roof of your casita and you're smelling the food that they're preparing and you, you, you're there. In, with the earth and then the ocean is right there. So it's, it's, for me, there's this whole combination of, it's almost like an ecosystem of, of truth. You know, that's, that's sort of the way I feel. And, you know, I also, and a lot of people I think think about this, like with Machu Picchu, I've been there very, uh, several, several times and felt the reverence of stepping onto that ground. Mm. You know, what, what, is, what, what does that feel like to you? I mean, I, I've, I've had different people give different answers. So I'm kind of curious to know what your answer is. When, when you, when you well, stepped on the ground, what, what was your experience like? I can tell you the very first time I, that I went to Machu Picchu, I didn't feel worthy of walking on the ground. Really? And so I, I, I was sort of brought through the experience and got there onto like through, they call it a, a sun gate. And so I, when I walked to the sun gate, um, I dropped to my knees, quite honestly. Hmm. And I knew that I was in a very special place for me. You know, lots of people walk through lots of places. You know, my house could be the same thing for me, my office or whatever. You can create it wherever you need to. But these were places where I really felt connected, where it, it, it energized me on a, on a level. Like when I would go to China, there was, you know, I would have an experience in places in China where I'd be walking and go, whoa, you know, and suddenly you're like, I don't know, is that a past life? Is that, you know, mm -hmm. what is the, what's the connection? But you just feel like, wow, this is really 
a sacred place. I've had that on beaches in Hawaii. You know, I've had that type of experience um, in Spain, um, in France. I went on a bit of a pilgrimage to a Mary Magdalene pilgrimage, as I call it, <laughs> and had many places where I walked into small little cathedrals and was like, whoa, you know, this is very sacred ground to me. So I don't know if that's giving you a little bit of perspective. No, on that's that. great. I'm, the, the hard part about that kind of a question is there's no clear, uh, clear cut way to answer it. You have to answer it based on what, you know, whatever feelings and emotions and, and metaphors work for you. And so that's what makes it kind of interesting to find out what the answer is going to be. So, right. Perfect. And that's why I kept saying that's the way I perspective, yeah. you know, that's my yeah, perspective yeah. Exactly. and the way I feel it and see it. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's truly as unique, I believe, to everyone. Everyone in fact, when you described how I think you, the word you used was you felt unworthy, the, the first thought that came to my mind is the earlier work you had done about shame. I'm wondering, like, was there a similar current going on there that you, you had done that, that previous work, but there were like, uh, you know, granules still left that, that you were connecting to or something. I'm not sure exactly what, but I'm, well, I'm just absolutely. And I can tell you the first time I went, I had not done the work yet. Oh, you hadn't done it yet. Oh, OK. So so that would make it a very profound connection. Correct. So then after going back, you know, going back, I've been there several times, as I said, bringing groups of people there. When you, um, you know, when you go back with a different consciousness and a different awareness and, mm. and worthiness, so to speak, mm -hmm. you then take that to the next level. Oh, yeah, sure. You know, you then start to say, well, what is my lesson here now? Now that, you know, I've sort of taken another step in whatever direction my journey is personally, mm -hmm. then um, what am I attracting to me next? What is my next lesson? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let, let's go back to the, uh, the the very first thing we mentioned. We've, we've taken this wonderful, I like this rabbit pole that we went down. This is a great rabbit <laughs> good, good, good. Me too. Really good one. But yeah. originally we were talking about, we have this certified master life coach here, and then we haven't yeah. talked about life coaching at all. So we really need to go down that road a little bit. <laughs> sure. So let, let, let's start with, first of all, um, most life coaches or coaches of any kind have typically one particular niche that they work with. Is there a niche that you work with? I, I truly do not any longer. Okay. okay. You know, at first I thought, oh yeah, I'm going to, you know, work with gay men or, you know, whatever the case may be. And I'm like, mm, no. I, I work with people who are really committed to making change in their life. Okay. So That's it's not a demographic idea. niche for sure, but it does sound like it's kind of a niche in, in that you are looking for somebody who's really committed. Yeah. Who's willing, you know, willingness mm -hmm. is a really big part of this. I, you know, if, because here's the difference with life coaching there, there, or here's one of the aspects of life coaching. There's definitely a need for life coaching and then there's a need for therapy. Mm -hmm. And they're two very different, different yeah. modalities. They, mm -hmm. they might get you similarly down the same road, but, um, you know, yeah, often. Um, but there's, you know, it's, I love to work with people who are in a space where, you know, not everything is perfect in life. It's, there is no such thing, but you're in a place where you feel as if you can, um, you're ready to go to the next level. You're, mm -hmm. you're not necessarily, um, still being pulled back with a trauma or something mm -hmm. like, and I'm not afraid to, and I certainly work with some clients on trauma and how it affects them moving forward in their life. But life coaching is truly, I always say is, is similar to, you know, we move people forward. We show possibility mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we show what's sort of in the way of that. Um, that's the way I describe it. So it's similar to like a sports coach where you're trying to move everyone down the field. You're trying to mm -hmm. be the person that holds the space and brings the idea where you can get you to where you want to be in your life. You know, we start with a vision and we look at what's the vision. Then we spend subsequent weeks looking at what's in the way of the vision and what do we need to do to move it away mm -hmm. and you, or to, to move these things away or break through them um, using tools that then you can use for any time perhaps something comes up in your life. So once you sort of look at and you sort of clear that path, then we get to the what becomes possible and we look at visibility and you know how do you become visible and truly step into the essence of who you are and use my acronym which is fly which is first love yourself 
Mm. How do we get you to fly at the end? I like that. That's nice. I hadn't used that. I hadn't heard that acronym before. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Really, really good. Um, and of course, life coaching is the, the, the field itself is, is fairly broad. It's fairly all encompassing. I mean, cause there are lots of different kinds of coaching that's more specific. I mean, there's like financial coaching and there's career coaching and uh, relationship and dating coaching and health coaching and like there's all these little s- sub niches. Um, that, that people often specialize in. But when you're focused on life coaching, you're not so much trying to focus on one particular area. You're simply trying to focus in on the essence of the person. Am I reading that right? Correct. And, and I know, I know that there are very specific things that some of the niche, niche coaches can bring. Right. You know, I don't have a financial background, so I can't tell you what's the best way sure. for you to like, you know, put your retirement together, but I can tell you what's in the way of your net worth. Mm. Mm-hmm. I can work with you because I, you know, again, I, my, one of my mentors, Nancy Levin has coined, you know, your, your net worth is in direct correlation to your self-worth. Yeah, that's true. So I can help you, you know, the, the financial planner could plan everything out for you, but if you don't believe that you're worthy and you don't believe that you have the self-worth, it's not going to work no matter what you do because you're going to continue to sabotage and sabotage and sabotage. And that, that's a really interesting thing too about uh, people who do the, the niche coaching uh, businesses because almost to a person, I can't really think of any exceptions actually. So I think I'll, I can say it's hundred percent of the time they are adopting and embracing the whole idea of the whole self as part of their practice. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's not like they're trying to be life coaches per se, but they recognize I got to include that in what I'm doing or else I'm not going to really serve my client. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. For sure. For sure. I I would say that um, what I, I do offer is a much more, much deeper dive. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we could work on, you know, worthy for it's a 12 week program actually where we're mm-hmm. looking at all aspects of your life or boundaries, which is one mm-hmm. of my favorites <laughs> we're looking at setting boundaries and, you know, and, and what it's, and talk about the strength of, you know, the power of who you are when you get through boundaries um, and, and really learn to create safe, healthy boundaries for yourself and realizing that no one crosses your boundaries. You're the only one that crosses your boundaries the the woman who has in the past always done the Thursday shows with me like this one uh, couldn't do it today, but her biggest thing is boundaries. So it's interesting that you're bringing up boundaries here. What is it about boundaries that, that resonates with you so strongly? Boundaries for me are a true measurement of your self love. Okay. You, you know that they, when, 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 you know, self care, um, you know, self love and selfish, when you can really have those three, um, and you can really stand in, in the truth of that. That's when you're in a place to set boundaries that you won't allow to be crossed. You know, the more you can set boundaries for yourself, the freer you are. A lot of people think boundaries are, um, you know, sort of shut you in where in fact, boundaries are very expansive and give you the opportunity to expand in your life. If you, if you really put those boundaries in place, and let um, yourself know that your boundaries are healthy and they're for you mm. and they're for your good and will move you forward. Yeah. You know, and, and one of the things about boundaries is oftentimes you don't even need to verbalize boundaries. You know, you can just set them. Mm. And, it, you know, one of the things I love that one of my mentors says is no is a complete sentence. This is true. It really yeah. is. Yeah. There's another thing about boundaries that I always find to be fascinating. We, we, we often talk about limiting beliefs, right? And, and usually we do it in the context of, well, this limiting belief is what's holding you back. Uh, but in fact, all of life is made up of limiting beliefs and many of them are, are good, such as a boundary. A boundary is a limiting belief, but it's a kind that is constructive rather than working against your best interests. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, and I do that with my new relationship blueprint work where I, I sort of teach people how to have a healthier relationship with themselves, mm. set boundaries that are healthy with themselves. Therefore, they can enter into relationships, not just right. intimate, but not, not just physically intimate, but you can ha- enter into relationships with the boundaries in place yeah. that perhaps you didn't have before because of codependency or people pleasing or worthiness or Mm -hmm. whatever the case may be, Mm -hmm. or the shadow beliefs or whatever it is that then you can really 
step in in a much more grounded place. It becomes your foundation. Boundaries are a foundation yeah. for um, really being like a roadmap for the life that you that you want. It's something that I've been thinking about a lot over the last couple of years, uh, reframing for myself what a limiting belief is, um, to kind of take away the, the negative association with it because all of life has limits to it. I mean, thank goodness. Otherwise we wouldn't have life. Mm-hmm. There's such a thing as physical matter without limits. It's not even possible to have physical matter without limits. If you take away limits, you don't have physical matter. You just have pure energy. <laughs> That's just the way True. it works. True. Yeah. But when it comes to these beliefs, I mean, and again, I'm sure you've, you, I know, cause I've listened to some of your um, stuff, like it, it becomes really, is the belief running you or are you running the belief? Yeah, exactly. Who's in charge? Who's in know? charge? Who's being served here? Yeah. Right. Exactly. You can have the belief, but if you understand the belief and what I like to do with clients is go back to the origin of the belief so we can mm. reframe it mm. and see that it might have served me when I was young to feel scared or to not understand what was going Great on. Point. Yeah. But it no longer serves me to hold on to that same belief. So as an adult with a discerning mind, how can I shift that belief so that it's it it can move me forward? You know, it really becomes, you know, who's who's in charge? You know, it's yeah. like, is this belief running my life and holding me back? Or you know, am I able to say, oh, there's just that belief that I'm stupid or whatever it is mm-hmm. and just say, OK, thank you for that information. But I'm good. Yeah. I know I'm not. You know, so I evidence I work with clients to evidence the opposite of the belief. Like, give me give me an example of when you've been smart, you know, mm-hmm. and they go, oh, yeah, I guess I have been. So it's a little bit of a, a shift, but it really comes down to with beliefs. Yeah, beliefs are there. They're formed when we're. Children usually, like Carl Jung, did that whole shadow belief mm-hmm. thing, which is brilliant. Yep. And mm-hmm. uh, lots of people work with with these beliefs, but it really becomes it really becomes a question of how long are you going to let them control you, or are you going to control them? Because that's that's the key. When you could when you could say, oh yeah, there's that crazy belief that I got from my grandmother, <laughs> but it no longer serves me as an adult. Uh-huh. That's when the shift can happen, and that's when freedom happens. Yes, you know, yes. And possibility. Yes, no doubt about that. Uh, because ultimately what we're really talking about here is the ability of the human being to have different uh, preferences over time and thereby to have different beliefs over time. Our beliefs can actually change, and Absolutely. that's perfectly acceptable. Absolutely. Yeah. It's only when we, to, when we try to put the belief in, in cement, that's when we run into problems. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah, when we're not flexible, when we're not willing to see other perspectives, like as mm-hmm. you were saying earlier, you yeah. know, where through the show you've you've you know considered so many other things. Mm-hmm. You know, again, it's just that these beliefs are, man, they can really hold you back. They they can keep you hiding. They can keep you small. They can keep you unable to move forward. And when you realize that they are just a belief, it is not a truth. You know, there, there's a difference between, you know, what is actually the truth here? Is this fact that you're stupid or is it fiction that you're stupid? We get <laughs> so stuck in the story versus what is the truth when we could say, what is the truth here? Mm-hmm. You know, the truth is that you're not stupid, you know, and, and it sounds very simple, but when you could sort of address it, when you can, when people, when some, when someone says, Oh, you know, I'm this and I'm that, like when you could just say, you know, is that fact or is that fiction? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, we love the fiction because our ego loves the fiction. The ego doesn't love the fact. It loves the fiction, loves the story. So it's a matter of busting them open and seeing if they still serve you or can we reinterpret those beliefs so that you can move forward. Those beliefs are always going to be there. We don't make them wrong. We just like to reinterpret them and we like to consider if they still serve us. Yeah, you're, you're, you're reflecting on the Byron Katie uh, principles there. Of, uh, is it really true? <laughs> Are Absolutely. you sure it is real? <laughs> right. Yeah, well, she will just continue to repeat it. Well, is that true? Or is that true? Until yeah. you're sort of like, stop saying that, but it's true. <laughs> it's absolutely. It, it annoys you because it's true, right? <laughs> yeah, and she's brilliant. She brought that to light. Absolutely. Thank you for that reminder. She brought that to light for sure.
Yeah, she sure did. Um, we're, we're running a little low on time, so I got to make sure we get through some stuff here. So first of all, um, there, there may be some people who have decided they, they want to reach out and little, learn a little bit more about what you're doing. Maybe they want to learn about the reinvention retreats. Maybe they want to learn about the coaching, whatever. So somebody who wants to learn more about Michael Mamina, how do they do that? How do they, what's the best way to find it? The very best way is michaelmamina.com. Go on my website. Um, from there, there's a free ebook there. Um, you know, five, uh, five minute steps to the life you want. Um, sign up on that. You can get on my email list. You can choose to unsubscribe if you want in the future, but you won't guaranteed. Um, and every week you'll get an email. You will not get spammed, all that kind of stuff. It's a one, once a week newsletter giving you information and tools. Um, also social media, Michael Mamina on Instagram. Uh, Michael Mamina Coach on Facebook. Um, I'm even now entering the TikTok world. So, oh my goodness, you uh, took yeah. the dive. Yeah, I'm like, I'm just gonna do it. I have no idea what I'm doing, Walt. It's sort of wacky over there. But, People who've been uh, trying it are telling me they love it. They really yeah, do. It's been interesting. It's been really yeah. interesting. Um, so I'm I'm there as well. But the best best place is the website MichaelMamina.com. Really okay. Cool. Good. Yeah. That's good stuff. And I also offer a free, um, you know, one hour session for people. Okay. Who want to just come and say hi and explore and see what's possible for them. No obligation. Um, there's a link on there, lots of links on there to actually sign up for a free session. Okay. So that's something anybody could just take advantage of. No cost. And just try it out. See what's, yeah, see if it works. Explore. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good stuff. I like that. All right. Um, and then there's one other thing I, I need to tell you. I think I made reference to this earlier in the show, but this is something I like to do every single show with every single guest because you, like all the other guests who come onto the show, we're, we're givers, right? That's why one of the reasons why you're here. You're, you're here, here to give. Right. Um, and, and you give in a lot of different ways. You give uh, through your, your email that you send out. You give through uh, other podcasts that you do, through articles. I'm not sure all the things that you do, but I know you do a lot of giving because I can tell you're a giver. That's what givers yeah. do. <laughs> Yeah. There's a funny thing about being a giver, though. Very often, we kind of skip over a very important piece of what a giver does, because the giver is giving out all this free content to people that you've never met, you've never seen, and in many cases, you never will see them. You never will meet them. You don't know who they are. You don't know what they learned from it. You don't know what they picked up. You don't know how they improved. And so we kind of dismiss that. Like, well, yeah, that's just part of the process. It's part of being, you know, marketing your service or whatever. But no, that's actually important stuff. So what I like to say is on behalf of those many people that you've never met, that you've never seen, that you're putting all this content out to and that you're helping in ways that you don't even know about, on their behalf, thank you for what you've been doing hmm. because you're making a difference in this life for a whole lot of people. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. It, yeah. it, it's that, That's why I do it because of the reaction you just gave. I mean, this is a big deal. Yeah, I'm taking it in. <laughs> this you. is a big deal. This is something that I swear our culture has just kind of dismissed as like it's not important. Yeah, it is important. It is. It is. We, we wouldn't have the internet that we have if it wasn't for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pure and simple. It, it, people giving what is important to them, knowing that other people are going to find that it's important. That's, that's the world. That's how we got this technological world we have. Yes. And I, I like to, I like to think that's the reason we're all here. And that's how I like to think that we're also contributing to the knowledge of the human race. So here we've just yeah. tied up and put a bow on top. <laughs> Perfect. I, I, yeah, I mean, I definitely get that. You know, it's that, that I believe that we are truly here. I don't believe we're here to do it alone. I believe that we're here to support. I tried for years. I, 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 yeah. I've been down that road. <laughs> right. Yeah. To support each other, to love each other, to uplift each other, mm. and to share what we know. Yeah. You know, when we can share it and give it, then we all benefit from that. And, and that's a beautiful thing. That's, I think, is beautiful and what life is about. Well, thank you for the benefit uh, that you gave us of sharing what you know. We appreciate that very much. Very and welcome. thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.